Welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast. And I'm very glad to have you back again. Just thank you for continuing to come back and support this podcast. And we have another very interesting guest for you today. Uh, we have Miss Brittany Kolb, who is a CRN CRNA by training and works as a CRNA as an anesthesia, providing anesthesia care, but also has a coaching business uh, for weight loss. And I think this is a very important uh, topic that we're going to be discussing tonight, not only weight loss, because we know so many people struggle with weight loss, but the mindset that it takes uh, to lose the weight and keep the weight off. So very glad to have you here, Brittany. I can't wait to learn more about your story. Are you interested in real estate? Are you tired of hearing about all the money that your friends and colleagues are making from their investments, but you don't know where to start? Don't worry, I got you. We are teaming up with Dr. Ronnie Shalev and Shawin Properties to equip you with the tools you need to feel empowered about your investments. So how do you get involved? Do these three things. First, go to my website at drderickthesportsdoctor.com and click on the sponsor link for Shawin Properties. This will give you access to a free webinar as well as the ability to have a discovery call with Dr. Ronnie Shalev. Also follow her on social media and stay tuned for more helpful tips coming at you on Money Mondays. Now back to the episode. Oh my gosh, Dr. Derek, thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to be here. Let's get started. I'm excited. Absolutely. So let's start off with what led you to a career in medicine as a CRNA? And tell us your path as well. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I started out, I was in high school and I remember being really drawn to like math and science and helping people. And so like when I was trying to, you know, when you're in high school and you're like trying to figure out like, what am I going to major in in college? Right. I was like, oh, well, I think nursing would just like totally fit all the things that I really liked. And so I ended up going from high school into a direct four-year BSN program, actually at the University of Delaware. And when I was at Delaware, I, in the summer and in the, um, in the off season, when I wasn't in, in like actively in school, I spent my summers, actually, I got a position as a, a surgical tech, not a tech. No, no, no. I was more of like a nurse's I forget the official position, but anyway, but I worked like in the pre-op and PACU. Yeah. Okay. I worked in the pre-op and PACU. So I help people get ready for surgery. And one of my neighbors was a CRNA and he let me come and observe some procedures in the OR and observe what he did in anesthesia. And I was just like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. This is so cool. I get to, I get to like take away people's pain. <laughs> I get to make them feel better. I get to keep them safe and comfortable while they're having major surgery done. You know, it's, it was, I just knew I was like, this is exactly what I want to be. So the path to becoming a nurse anesthetist, you have to have a bachelor's of science in nursing first, and then you have to um, work in an ICU and intensive care for at least, I think a minimum is a year. I worked it in the ICU for four years before I went back to anesthesia school. And so, and when I was in, when I was in the ICU, it was even more solidified that like, I really enjoyed working with like one or two patients at a time. Cause in the ICU, the it's such, they're you're working with such critical patients that you really, you need one nurse to one patient or one nurse to two patients to be able to provide them with the care that they need. And I was like, yeah, like, this is what I want to be doing. I want to be taking care of one person at a time, focusing on that person entirely. And that's why I think anesthesia was really a good fit for me as well. And I liked the quick having to be like thinking on your feet. I liked the quick having to be like having to prioritize really quickly. I liked having to think a lot. I liked having to kind of look at like the big picture of the patient and figure out like what would be like the right anesthesia plan. Um, I liked being challenged and I liked, I liked a lot of different types of surgeries and patient populations. And so it's kind of, it was cool being like, oh, I get to take care of a kid today. And oh, I get to do a heart today. And oh, I get to do a deep brain stimulator today and help cure people's essential tremors and Parkinson's disease. It's just amazing, right? I mean, you get to do so many yeah. things. So anyway, that was very long-winded, but <laughs> that's how I ended up becoming doing anesthesia. And so I went to finish my anesthesia training at Georgetown University 
and then moved um, down to Richmond, Virginia. And I've been practicing anesthesia now for eight years. And yes, and so, I still do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned as anesthesia, but one thing that's very important is as anesthesiologist, you have to be able to calm the fears, right? So many mm -hmm. people walk, roll in and they're terrified and you don't want to put them to sleep anxious because we know that they tend to wake up like they go to sleep. Um, so I think it's very important for an anesthesiologist to be, or CRNA to be able to have the tools to be able to relate to someone, you know, not just come in and say, hey, I'm the anesthesiologist, I'll be putting you to sleep. You have to be able to talk to them. And, you know, you guys can get information out of them that they, nobody else can when you start telling them, hey, I'm putting you to sleep. I really need to know the truth. <laughs> you yeah. know, at the last second, they'll start to kind of spill everything. Uh, well, mm -hmm. I did have a little drink or I did have this or I did do this. Um, so how do you use those same skills in your coaching um, that you do for weight loss? That's a great question. Look at you. That's awesome. <laughs> I, you know, when I think about what the goal is, right? What we're, what the goal is here is like my goal when I do anesthesia is to work together with my patient to, you know, again, get all the information from them that they need and to create a, like a safe place for them to be like, I'm here for you. I am going to take care of you. I'm going to keep you safe and comfortable. There's a certain, you know, rapport and trust that's created almost instantly. And I, and I feel like a lot of that comes with just like being real with the person. This is who I am. This is what I do. I'm here for you. Like eye contact with them being really like, you're not just my patient right now, but like, you're my patient for the next hour, hour and a half. I am here for you the entire time. And I think like you set up that relationship, you set up that, um, you establish that early on and it's like, we're in this together, you know? And I feel like I kind of almost apply the same thing. It's like, I need to get to know you really well. I need to understand where you're coming from and like, you know, what your concerns are, what the problem is, especially if they come to me and they're from, you know, if it's a patient and they're really nervous, they have a bunch of questions. It's like, what's going on? Let's talk about these things. Same thing with, um, with coaching, right? Cause in coaching, the goal is like, we have, you have something that you would like to change. I'm going to help you change it. And I'm going to help you use your mind to do that. Um, the differences in coaching though, is that I get to work with people one-on-one -on -one or in small group settings for a longer period of time to create that change. So, yeah. um, yeah. but yeah, I think, I think establishing that, like that comfort level. And it's like, I'm here for you. Everything I do is for you. And I think people like that. They want to know that they're being cared for by someone that really cares about them. And it really has their best interest at heart. And is here to either in surgery, get them through to the other side and have them be well, wake up relatively comfortable. And for in my surgery center, have them go home and, you know, have a, a nice post-operative anesthesia recovery period. And in coaching again, like be able to move on with their lives and create the results that they want in terms of either sustained weight loss or gaining control around food, whatever it may be that they are looking for. So I'm still relatively new to the topic of coaching from a medical mm -hmm. standpoint or from a lifestyle standpoint. Of course, we're all very familiar with coaching um, from a sports standpoint because you're introduced to that early in life or most people are or, you know, for band or for different activities. But it was new to me, I'd say probably in the last three to four years when I started to hear people talking about life coach or mm -hmm. business coach or, you know, coaching to help people in whatever realm that they've deemed their specialty or their niche. So what was your introduction to coaching? How did you first learn about it? Such a good question. So um, actually from a physician, I first was introduced to life and weight loss coaching. Um, and I, I talk about this all the time, Katrina Ubell. She is a pediatrician who actually went through the like a uh, coaching program through the same coaching um, place that I was certified through and she found life and weight loss coaching. So she became a certified life and weight loss coach. And she has a podcast called weight loss for busy physicians. And so I started listening to it and I was just like, Oh my gosh, like this is this, that so that was the main introduction, but the premise is really like when it comes to weight loss, everybody focuses on actions. We need to exercise more. We need to eat less. Mm -hmm. We need to 
count calories and macros, right? We need to eat more protein or like, and it's all very focused on what you're supposed to do, right? The thing is that I came to realize through coaching was that your actions are driven by your feelings and your feelings are actually driven by your thoughts. So ultimately what you think will drive your feelings which will drive your actions, which will give you your results. And so if we're only focused on the actions, we never actually get to deal with the thoughts and the feelings that are contributing to the actions. So I'm going to give you an example. Like if you have a person, if, a, you know, myself, I'll give use myself an example. Like I, prior to this weight loss journey, enjoyed overeating. I enjoyed eating food to the point that I was very, very full. I enjoyed eating food when I wasn't actually hungry. And I did this and I had these thoughts that led to this desire that would create the action of me eating food when I wasn't hungry and overeating when I was already satisfied, which created the result of having about 40 extra pounds of weight in my body that I really didn't want there. And the thoughts that lead to that desire are multifactorial. They can be behavioral, relate, they can be related to, um, to emotions right? It can be like, I've had a bad day. I'm really stressed out. I'm really anxious. And if you use food to, to handle that, that stress and relieve that anxiety, it's a well-worn thought pattern that will continue to increase your desire to come to keep doing that over and over again. If you have a hormonal imbalance, like, you know, the foods that are highly hyper palatable and are basically designed for to be overeaten and overconsumed, right? Like you're going to have dopamine reward pathways that are well worn in your brain that you can actually break by rewiring them through coaching. If you've got like behavioral eating patterns that are brought down to you, that are, you know, that you kind of adopt, like, again, these are thoughts like, oh, well, I have to finish my plate. That's a, something I have to do. And you have this like urgency, this desire, like it's almost uncomfortable if you don't finish your plate because you were yeah, told as a kid, you have to do that. Yeah. yeah. Right. So in coaching, we deal with what are the thoughts that are leading to the desire to want to eat and overeat? Like, what is, where is that all coming from? Because if we don't change that, then it doesn't matter if you're going to count calories or macros or do some exercise program for a certain period of time. We've never changed the way you think about food and the way you utilize food in your life. And so that's what we do in coaching. We have to so be great permanent change by creating yeah, do, change in your do brain. Do you find that people usually come to you for coaching after they failed multiple diets or do you feel that people usually come to you and say, okay, I'm having trouble with my weight. I need you to teach me how to approach eating or how to approach a weight loss program. How does that usually work? That's another great question. I think, um, I think it's a combination of people. I, th I think it's like, they're like, you know, I've been listening to your podcast or I read what you do on social media. And it's like, I feel like I'm on this hamster wheel of, I just finished, you know, trying to do keto and that didn't work for me. It's not sustainable. Right. Or right. I just did weight watchers again for the fifth time. And I can't keep the weight off. I get it off and I can't keep the weight off. Right. It's like, they become enlightened to the fact. And I had a very similar journey. I was like, I, I, was about to sign up for Weight Watchers for my fifth or sixth time when I was like, no, 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 I have got to figure this out. And so they come to me, yeah, being like, no, I really would like to figure out how I can lose weight and keep it off forever because I don't want to do this anymore. I know that I eat food emotionally for the most part, people eat food emotionally, um, which is for any reason that is eating beyond hunger, truly. I mean, that's like the only, like that is, the definition of emotional eating for the most part. So everybody does it a little bit and they just don't really know what to do about it. And so that's really why, that's why they end up coming to me. And that's, and they're usually like, they also know that it's not, they're not looking for a quick fix. They don't want a quick fix. If they're coming to me, they know they need to make permanent change in their brain, brain and they're willing to invest some time and some real mental energy into like, I'm going to figure this out once and for all. And I do provide them also with a sustainable way of eating, a way of eating that kind of serves them for their lifetime, not just a diet that we do just to get the weight off. It's like, no, 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 we're just going to eat this way forever and it's going to be great and you're going to love it. <laughs> so yeah, there's that piece so, too. You know, we know that weight is a very taboo subject, right? It's very mm -hmm. sensitive. You know, people can get very sensitive about weight. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a part of the 
you know, I deal with pa patients that have arthritis. So when we're going through treatment for arthritis, at some point, I know I have to address weight. And it's not something that I necessarily feel comfortable with bringing it up because you never know the reaction. Sometimes you'll get, yes, I know my weight. I've been working on it. I've lost this much weight. I have a plan. Sometimes you get, you know, a couple of eye rolls and, you know, people shut down immediately. Sometimes you even get tears because there's a lot of feelings about their weight or there's guilt and shame and a lot of emotions about weight. Um, so what do you recommend for just pre providers or people who are not dealing with weight loss and, you know, to in depth as you are, but still have to talk to it with their patients or uh, with family members? How can you gently approach weight and provide helpful information without offending people? And I know that's okay. loaded, but. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first of all, I mean, to be perfectly honest, Katrina did a really great podcast on this, on like how to help your clients. I should give it to you. I know you're you're interviewing me, yeah. but I know that she did a really great podcast on this. So I always like to give her credit because I think she's amazing. I will say for, first of all, I don't care what any one ways. And I don't care what my clients weigh and I don't care what they want to weigh. That's not my job. My job is to help them achieve whatever result they want to achieve, whether it's, you know, losing a certain amount of weight or just gaining control around food, right? Like that's, I'm not here to tell you what you, what anyone should weigh. And I don't think anyone has to necessarily lose weight if they don't want to. Right. So like, first, first of all, like, I just want to be super, super clear on that. I think it's tricky because a lot of people do want to lose weight. And what I think people don't really realize and don't understand is that a lot of like weight issues are not their fault. And they think, they think it is, they think it's their fault that they are the way that they are and that they have, they don't have the control around food that they would like, or they don't, um, they can't seem to like say no to certain things. And what I want to offer to them is that's just really not, not true at all. Right. Like people have normally functioning human brains that are designed to increase pleasure, decrease pain and do that as efficiently as possible. And food is incredibly good at that, mm -hmm. right? Food does all that all at the same time. And so it makes really good sense that your brain gets rewarded with a flood of dopamine beyond really what our bodies are really supposed to be normally handling, right? Like back in the day, the we weren't eating refined carbohydrates and sugar all the time. And so all of a sudden you get that and it's like, that is important. I need to eat more of that. And that's what your brain yeah. tells you. Right. And it creates yeah. these really intense desire pathways that are just so strong. It's like, no wonder, like we're defenseless against these things. And then you've got industries that are devoted to making foods hyper palatable and super delicious and to be eaten and addicted to more or less you know? And so it's like, you know, it's like, I know what I should be doing, but it's hard. I'm like, yeah, of course it's hard. Of course it's hard. Everything is pitted against you. And so I think just leveling with people and being like, I know this isn't easy. And we're dealing with this from a multifactorial place. It's not, you are not the problem, not at all. And I think when you, when you approach people from that place, and being really truly and honest. And I truly believe that, right? And I also truly believe that they can make a change if they want to. It just might take a different approach than they're used to, right? And I think they're just, I think a lot of people too are just like, I know what I need to do, but I don't know how to do it. I know what I need to do. And I think there has to be, there has to also be like, I'm here for you. Like, I'm going to provide you with certain resources that I think might provide you with actual permanent change. Like, because no one can go on a 1200 calorie diet forever right. and no one can go on keto forever. I mean, some people can actually, and they actually feel really good about it. You know, no one can count macros forever and like still go on vacation and like go out to eat. Like it just doesn't work. It's just not sustainable for some. I mean, listen, some people do that and that's amazing. And that's great. I just know all the people that come to me, it doesn't work. So yeah, I think, I think there's also, I think Katrina did put it really well. She was just like, are you, she, she mentioned, she was like, are you open to discussing your weight? You know, just like, just like a very open like question. 
as opposed to like, you're going to get, you know, like this knee replacement is going to serve you better if you are able to lose a little bit more weight, or maybe you don't even need it. If you know what I'm saying? Like, I think it's, I think it's like a hard, it's a hard place. The Sabre training bat is like no other training bat you've ever used before. So the purpose of the Sabre training bat with its modified barrel is so that you can perfectly sequence and get behind the ball, getting the bat on plane sooner, creating less miss hits, more line drives, higher batting averages, and more exit velocity. The Sabre training bat is the number one training bat on the market. Sabre Bats, the training bat that's going to take you to your best swing. That are you open question mm -hmm. is so important because if you're not open, I might as well keep my mouth shut, right? Because if mm -hmm. you're not open, I'm going to offend you. You're going to ignore me or mm -hmm. both. You know, it's, it's very hard if that door is not open and you're not willing to accept education or willing to make a change. And I really think that that's a big part of it is the mindset piece. You know, I talk about mindset a lot on my podcast and you mentioned, you know, you have thoughts, actions, and feelings um, and actions. I think when I hear weight loss, I hear more actions. Okay, I'm starting this diet or I'm doing this diet, or I'm going to start working out, I'm going to start whatever. And how long can you sustain that if you don't have your thoughts and feelings in order? And I think the sustainable piece is truly the piece that's the most important part with dieting. I like to tell people, don't worry about a diet, you know, a term diet, keto, Atkins, whatever. You need to make lifestyle changes because lifestyle changes it's more something that can be sustained more so than I'm going to starve myself on this diet because I have a reunion to go to. I have a wedding. I have this dress I have to fit into goal oriented, you know, this, that small goal. Once it passes, what's next? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I think so much of what I kind of focus on with the mindset with my clients, like we go through this practice where it's like, okay, well, how does the person who's already lost the weight show up at this birthday party? How does the person that's already lost the weight, you know, approach, you know, going out to dinner with their partner? How does the person that's already lost the weight, you know, support themselves in periods of stress and anxiety and overwhelm? It's becoming that person now as you're doing it, not just doing this little, making this actionable change for for a piece of time, right? It's not that it's actually like becoming that person, having the brain of the person who has lost the weight and has that control around food that they're really looking for. And what would you say is the most rewarding part about what you do and how you, you know, try to help and coach other people with their weight? What was the mm. most rewarding for you? Oh my gosh, so much. I mean, I see my clients and yeah, they lose weight, but like, they feel so much better. They feel better in their, in their body. They can move their bodies better. They, they feel more confident. They love themselves more, not because they've lost the weight, but just because of the way that they now think of themselves and the way that they treat themselves. Right. They're creating things for themselves. Like they're creating lives, lives for themselves. They never even dreamed possible. They're like creating goals for themselves that they never dreamed possible. And one of the things that I think is like super interesting is breaking generational patterns. Um, I had a client come to me who lost someone they loved dearly to complications relating to obesity. And they're like, I can't, I'm not going to be that person. I can't be that person. I won't let myself be that person. I'm not going to be that person. I, for my kids and it has to stop with me. This is where this, my family's been like this for a long time and it's going to stop now. I'm going to figure this out. I think that's really profound, like breaking generational patterns and cycles of these things is, is really, really, really profound. And so 
I mean, there's so many rewarding things. I mean, people also have the better relationships, like in general, right? They have better relationships. Like they feel better with their friends. They feel more grounded. They know how to set boundaries. Like it's not just weight loss. It's like, we talk about so many things when it comes to life coaching that it's like, yeah, okay. I feel good. And again, I'm really glad I lost some weight, but I also (laughs) like, you know, I feel so much better in everything that I do in my job, with my friends, with my partner, with my sister, with my parents, like everything's better as a result of all of this. And so it's just really great to see someone really step into like the best version of themselves and the best version of their lives. And is there usually a point when you know, like, okay, this person is going to succeed or this person's really struggling and probably not going to kind of continue? What keys do you typically Hmm. see from people who are successful with their weight loss journey? Well, everyone has their own journey, right? And so like, there's not always a linear path. Everyone wants there to be a linear path. (laughs) Everyone wants that path to go down and easily, right? But if it was that simple, then everyone would just be whatever weight they wanted and no one would be trying to lose weight or no one would be trying to, you know, be working with me. Right. So everyone's path is a little bit different. Um, and I think I, it's like, I can't say that anyone hasn't been successful when they've been working with me. Everyone has gotten results that they've been looking for. So, but I mean, but are certain people's paths a little, little more linear and downward? Yeah. And are some people's paths a little more like this? Sure. But I think there has to be a level of I'm willing to keep trying, right? Like I'm willing to keep looking at my thoughts and my feelings and my actions and evaluating them, you know? Because I think people come and they, they're like, okay, I've had, I have a lifelong history. I'm talking like elementary school history of dieting and being on the hamster wheel of weight loss. And they want it all fixed really quickly. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, it doesn't, you know, it, it, remember you have a lifetime of this under your belt. Like it's, it might take a few months. Now I typically work with people for at least six months. Um, I had had, I have had like a few clients do three months and I have had clients that have signed on with me for even longer just because they enjoy the life coaching aspect of it. And they just want to keep working with me, which is perfectly fine. I find that the six month, um, container is a really great starting point and a really great place for most people. Um, but I also think that there's always room for growth. I mean, I have my own business coach. I see life coaches. I see coaching mentors all the time and I'm, you know, I've lost my weight and, but, you know, I, I see the benefit of coaching and the coaching long-term there's always room for growth and there's always room for development. And so I think six months is a really, really good starting point for some people. It's all they need. And they're, I, you know, check in on them and they're doing great. And for other people, they need a little bit more time and that's totally fine too. But in terms of like, you have to be willing to write, it's personal. People want to be like, you know, yeah, I I just, it didn't work. Like, you know, I just, I, I, I overate and I don't know what happened and let's just not talk about it. I'll do better tomorrow. And when I see that, I'm like, no, 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 no. We, we, this is, this is where we learn. This is where we grow. This is where we don't beat ourselves up. We don't judge. This is where we figure out what was going on in your brain. So we can show up differently next time. So we can gain control over that. Right. And if people don't want to do that piece of it and they don't want to kind of dig in, then coaching is not going to be useful to them. I agree with that a hundred percent, hundred percent. So on time out with the sports doctor, this is your final time out. Wow. So, you know, as we approach holidays and mm. of course, closing an, another year and starting a new year, we know resolutions, right? Resolutions are always big, you know, towards the end of the year. Most people will say, okay, I'm going to start fresh, whatever new year. How mm. do you, you know, what's kind of your advice around that with resolutions or do you kind of counsel people to make resolutions or to kind of steer away from those? What do you think about that? Hmm. That's a really good question. I mean, I guess I asked the question, like, has making a resolution like on January 1st ever worked for you? (laughs) Like if you want to make a change, yeah. like what's, what are we waiting for? Like, let's get started. 
you know, like, let's like get started now. Like, what do you want? Do you want the holidays to look the same this year as they did last year? I don't know about like, I historically prior to all this, like would gain 10, five, 10 pounds easily over the holidays, maybe even 15, just like easily without any question. Right. Because I'd be like eating all the things and there'd be a lot of scarcity and, and stuff. So it's like, do you want to be that person? Like, is that the person you really want to be? Is that the person you envision yourself being? Or like, let's just get started. Let's get this started now. Right. Because I feel like there's like that big push and people are doing a lot of a like actions. They're like, I'm going to diet and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to do all these things. But I'm like, list. <laughs> mm-hmm, I'm going to do all the things, but I'm not going to change the way I think about it. So like we can, but I, I say, if you're going to make a resolution, like make a resolution to really figure it out, make a resolution to change your relationship with food, make that resolution. Don't make the resolution. They're going to be in the gym five days a week. Let's like figure out why we are here. Let's figure that out and let's resolve to get that done and figure this out once and for all. That's what I would say. Perfect. (laughs) You know, so I'm going to be honest with you completely. I mean, we're recording this on probably Uh the worst junk food day of the year, right? So it's Uh it's Halloween. And really I was thinking, I was like, okay, I'm speaking to a coach about weight loss. Mm. Will people receive this in November and December, or should I just release this like January 1st when everybody wants to attack their resolutions? And you just answered that question for me, because if I do that, I'm doing the same thing that that person's doing when they say, let's just wait until 2023 and it's going to be all better in 2023. But what we have to do is take one day at a time and, you know, the athletes, I talk to athletes, they always say 1% better. I need to be Mm. 1% better today than I was yesterday, which means that it's a process. And I, you know, don't focus on the goal, focus on the day-to-day grind and the day-to-day process of just getting better and continuing to put one step, one foot in front of the other and continue to attack whatever, you know, weight or, you know, money or whatever that thing that seems really daunting and really overwhelming for you one day at a time is how you approach it. So Mm -hmm. thank you for that answer. Now I know that this is what people need during the holiday season, not just once you've done all the damage for the holidays and then say it's new year's, let's start again. Yeah. I love the one day at a time thing. Yeah, Super good. Like little baby actionable steps. Like, let's just like make make progress one day at a time. It's perfect. And that it makes it, you know, when you set small goals, instead of just saying, Hey, I'm going to lose X amount of weight, control what you can control. And Mm -hmm. you know, what you can control is saying, I'm going to wake up and I'll, you know, eat three snacks or I'll, whatever is your plan, make it something that you can achieve, get some small W's, get some small wins and then start to attack some of the bigger things. Awesome. You well, should be a life you, coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a life coach. I'm just not yes, a you certified are. life coach. You know, it's <laughs> funny because this is what I've been doing for a long time. And that's one reason why I started a podcast because I always seem to find myself in a counseling environment with people or people will feel comfortable to say, hey, go talk to Dr. Burgess or go talk to you know, this kid wants to become a doctor, go talk to Dr. Burgess. This kid is struggling in school, go talk to Dr. Burgess. This kid wants to start a company, go talk to Dr. Burgess. So I feel that the coaching thing is something that I do naturally. It's just not something that I've carved out as a, from a business standpoint. Yeah, you're amazing at it. So cool. <laughs> you. <laughs> you're welcome. So tell everyone how they can follow the work that you're doing, how they can connect with you and how they can seek you out to be a coach if need be. Um, Yeah. So my website is weightlossbybernie.com and you can book a consultation with me. If you click the link, the program, you'll kind of get a little bit more, more information about the programs that I have. I'm enrolling my next, I do very small, intimate coaching groups of six people at a time, um, which combines group and one-on-one coaching. And I'm enrolling my next group, um, January for the, for January 3rd, actually. 
Um, so that is happening as we speak. I'm also on Instagram, weight loss by Brittany as well. And I put a lot of like coaching tips and tools and things and videos and things like that. And my website also has some of my favorite recipes and blog posts and my Pinterest boards. I just try to make this easy for people. Right. I have a Facebook business page as well. Same, all the same handle. And my podcast is actually Weight Loss for Busy Sierra Name Moms. That's the name of my podcast. And so, yeah, I would love to help you. I am here for you. And if I can do this, anybody can. I'm here to tell you. It's now, possible. do you work only with CRNAs or do you work with women specifically or who's welcome to kind of follow along? I know anyone can follow the podcast because I listen mm -hmm. to a lot of women podcasts, but who can work with you specifically? So I work with women in healthcare, primarily advanced practice nurses. So CRNAs, nurse practitioners, as well as nurses, uh, midwives, I'm trying to think. And I also work with busy moms as well. You know, we talk about like businesses and like niching down, but here's the thing. I'm a mom. I'm a working mom. I'm a mom in healthcare and I love working with all of those people. <laughs> so I'm like, I, you know, I have, I work with moms who are also like, you know, CEOs of companies and they might not be in healthcare, but I really like working with them because I understand the mom piece. I like working with women that are again, like CRNAs, just like me that are, you know, working long shifts in hospitals or taking call. Like I understand all of that and navigate all of that. Um, or a combination of the two, right? Nurses working 12 hour shifts, nurse practitioners seeing multiple patients in, in the room. Like I, I get the bits and pieces of all of it. And I understand a lot of the challenges. And so I, I work with women in healthcare and busy moms and usually a combination of all of those people. So, perfect, and perfect. women specifically. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for coming on and thank you for providing this excellent information and you've been a blessing to me. So I can't wait to share this with the rest of the audience. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for everything that you're doing. This is incredible. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace. Trust, you don't want to miss, this is where life, sports, and medicine is.